This video is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon. The costs we've been having in Canada and the U.S. have been so extreme and out of whack from the rest of the world. All of our projects are just that much more expensive than, say, low-cost European or Asian counterparts. This is Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. Not the Waterloo where Napoleon lost, and not the Abbasong, but the home of Blackberry, if any of you young people remember, in the early 2000s. With just under 600,000 people across three cities and four rural townships, Waterloo Region is the smallest metro area in North America with urban rail transit. Population-wise, think Scranton, Pennsylvania, or Spokane, Washington. Further away, Waterloo Region is a little bigger than Wellington, New Zealand, but a little smaller than Belfast, Northern Ireland. We've been told by the province to plan for uh, significant growth in uh, population, a million people by the year 2035. So we had to respond to that. The plan was then to intensify our existing uh, urban area so that we would grow up rather than grow out. A rapid transit system, the experts said, would be a way to incent that type of intensification. Opened in 2019, the 19-kilometer, 12-mile Ion Light Rail connects two malls, two downtowns, two universities, and one GO train station that takes you to Toronto in under two hours. A number of us visited uh, a few different cities that had rapid transit systems, including Calgary uh, and Portland, Oregon. We learned a lot from Portland uh, in terms of uh, which technology to use, 40% uh, more ridership on a train rather than a rapid bus system, 40% uh, more investment by investors when they know that the, the route is not going to change. ION is really interesting because it's among the very few projects in recent memory in Canada that have been built at relatively low costs. ION cost around $42 million per kilometer. That's uh, inflation adjusted international dollars. So $42 million per kilometer is, is relatively cheap, especially when you compare it to recent projects of similar scope in Canada and also in Ontario. For one great example is the Finch West LRT being built in northern Toronto. That thing is set to cost north of $240 million per kilometer. That's an extreme amount of money to be paying for what is a surface streetcar line. The cost to build transit has exploded across the Anglosphere, from Ontario to the US, UK, New Zealand. Even while countries as different as Spain, Korea, and Finland retain the ability to build cheaply. One great example is Helsinki, Finland, famously good social safety net, high taxes, high cost of living, etc. They're able to build their newest um, orbital tram line for around 20 million per kilometer, about half the cost of ION. Where does ION land us in, in the global perspective? It did all right. right? It's an average performer, but com certainly compared to other projects in the US and Canada, it's a shining star. So it's our job to ask how, how, how ION did it and how come we aren't able to replicate that again. From talking to Jedwin, a transit researcher who works a lot with comparative data in different places, and Tom, who is actually involved with the ION from the political side, here are five main reasons the ION LRT was able to avoid the worst of Anglo transit cost disease. The first thing they did right was they were very, very clear on their scope of work. The region of Waterloo knew exactly what they wanted. They knew exactly where the stations were going to go. And oftentimes, the conception of your project at the very beginning, especially early stage planning, that sets how the rest of the project delivery is going to go. And Waterloo executed on this very well. It wasn't just like, build us a 16 or 18 kilometer light rail system, however you wish. It, it was really, the design didn't leave much wiggle room for them. We credit the, the fact that our uh, consultants and uh, legal consultants uh, which we spent a lot of money on, um, put together a really tight agreement. A little more money and certainly a, a little more time up front putting the, uh, the agreement together. If we look at other really expensive projects in Ontario, a lot of times the scope is not solidified at the start of the project. It could be political in the sense that politicians want to change where the train is going. Like they want to change the alignment of the line. They want to change where the stations are placed. It could be an expertise issue, for example, in the public sector, they 
don't really know what they want. They just know that they need to have a line that goes from A to B. They don't know exactly where it's going to go. You end up with a line that's not well defined. So when they go into construction, oftentimes there's lots of change orders. You know, even while it's under construction, they're asking for changes. It could even be that the concrete has already been poured and they ask for the concrete to be ripped out and put in another place. Change orders, particularly changes to a project that happened in the late stage because of unsolidified uh, scope, because you don't know what the project's going to be, that costs a lot of money and it adds to the time and it adds to the risk of delivering a project. We owned a, um, a rail line, which we had purchased and it went right through the university property and it, it was, you know, kind of an ideal, uh, part of the, the route. The region of Waterloo had to break some conventional rules that we have in North America for building transit by reusing this line. So it's an active freight line. It's used once a week overnight when our trains aren't running. Usually you are not allowed to run light rail vehicles on the same tracks as a freight train, but they recognized the opportunity that the alignment was there. So you had to get a bunch of waivers to allow the light rail trains to run next to freight. It showed a level of ingenuity. They were able to say, hey, like, let's find a way because this will save us a lot of money to take advantage of this existing rail line. If we wouldn't have got approval, if I suspect the right of way would have allowed for another rail to be installed and, you know, additional cost course. The railway allowed them to put some of the most intensive facilities on that land. So for example, the operating maintenance facility adjacent to the existing rail corridor. So a fourth of the line is not small chips, right? We do share the right of way with freight, uh, on another part of the road as well, but they're on a separate rail. It's, it's within the same right of way, but doesn't use the same tracks. On top of those two sections where the LRT shares tracks or a corridor with freight rail, there's also a section where it follows the power transmission corridor. Altogether, these add up to about a third of the system length. The project wouldn't happen if there wasn't a region. The planning at that time, uh, at that scale, at, at the high level was, was at the region and, and we needed to respond to the, uh, the imperative, uh, of how we were going to grow. They had the political backing to get what they want. I'd say this is certainly different from other projects in Ontario that involve multiple levels of government, but region of Waterloo holds the municipalities under it. And also the transit agency is managed by the region, Grand River Transit. And also the region manages the roads, the wastewater, the sewers, the utilities. When they deliver the project, they can reduce the amount of delays and in permitting or in utility relocation because the region has authority over those matters. Whereas, you know, in other projects in Ontario and in Canada, we're having to juggle multiple levels of government, all these different utility providers, third parties, and oftentimes that process, that bureaucracy of coordinating across all these different agencies or companies, et cetera, landowners, that's what adds time and cost to the delivery projects. I don't want to say it went perfectly smoothly because there were disputes between the local municipalities and the region on some occasions, but uh, everybody was behind the project. So there were no naysayers. There was nobody dragging their feet. Every, uh, the cities of Kitchener and Waterloo saw the great potential in this as well and were fully supportive. And of course, the mayors by our own regional council. Um, or for example, in Montreal's REM. The provincial government was really supportive, so they passed legislation to get that project greater permitting authority to acquire land or dig up utilities, etc. Lots of things can go wrong on a transit project, costing time and money. The REM in Montreal encountered explosives in an old tunnel. The ION received its trains late from Bombardier. Tom and Jedwin both stressed the importance of reducing and managing risk, but differed a little on what that meant. Tom explained that, as a small municipality, it was important to design the contract so that the private consortium building the project took responsibility for most cost overruns. With consultants' help, we decided that the 3P would be a DFBOM project, so that's design, finance, build, operate, and maintain. We were very risk-averse. You know, we're a community of 650,000 people. Uh, and it's a good sized community, but to, to put in this kind of an infrastructure piece, we needed to transfer all the risk, uh, to the, uh, the consortium. We just didn't feel we could carry the risk. Jedwin argued that handing off risk to the private sector is not a silver bullet or even necessarily best practice, but Waterloo planned and performed this public private partnership, particularly proficiently. You could 
mitigate risk by solidifying the scope of your project. When you go to bid, you really know exactly what you want. So in the case of ION, that's exactly what they did to manage the risk. They said, we're going to have a surface tramway. It's going to use this existing alignment that we own. It's going to run on the street in these places. And we have the adequate authority to relocate ut utilities where we need to run the tram. And so that gives confidence to the private sector partner from many reports that we've read, the relationship between the public sector and the private sector was less adversarial. We had a pretty good uh, relationship with them uh, throughout the, uh, the entire public shipment. Tom also mentioned that private bidders now seem to be charging more to take on risk for what it's worth. We were fortunate to be fairly early out of the chute in terms of the, the, the variety of projects that were coming down the pipe at that time. The, the way they price these projects has changed significantly in order to mitigate their risks. So, I mean, they are in business to make money, and there's nothing wrong with that. But uh, I think they've learned a lot uh, in, in the Canadian market. They're pricing their, their projects accordingly. We, we, we didn't put a lot of bells and whistles on it. I mean, it's a very functional um, system. If you look at all the ion stations, they're all very standardized. They're all very simple. You know, they have one basic shelter that's all the same across all the stations. There's no fancy artwork. It's just different colored paneling. One thing I also lament, but of course, you know, you can't have everything, is that along certain parts of the route, we were not able to uh, um, really satisfy active transportation facilities without a lot of other land acquisition. Uh, which would have been very expensive. We already, you know, were involved in uh, 250 land takings, some complete and some partial along the route. And in order to accommodate active transportation in certain parts of the route, it would have, it would have required full takings of very expensive uh, real estate. Ever seen these terrifying bike lanes posted online? Those are ion tracks. This is Waterloo. The LRT is only on this particular road for a kilometer, so it wouldn't have made a big difference anyway. But you can use transit projects to upgrade things like bike lanes with an extra cost. A lot of these light rail projects, particularly in Ontario, where we're so ideologically fixated that it must run down the middle of a giant road, oftentimes the municipalities will hold that project hostage and say you need to maintain the road capacity. So of course, our LRT projects turn into road winding projects. Reducing the amount of road work you have to do certainly reduces the cost of the project. Most people only saw this as a transportation system. I'm never going to use it, so what's in it for me? It really normally only took me 30 seconds to change their mind if I could get 30 seconds because you would tell them, no, you, you don't have to use it. <laughs> you don't have to give up your car. Some people might, but you don't have to. This is going to help you because we're going to have uh, less congestion on the streets, less, less gridlock. Um, we aren't going to have to build bigger roads. We're going to save $300 million in road construction costs over a 30-year period. Oh, you don't expect me to take it? Yeah, okay, well, then I'm fine with it <laughs> kind of thing. We're still a very car-centric society. And, and, you know, the results were there fairly quickly, too. Our consumption of greenfield lands went down by 50%, and our intensification went up exponentially. Let's recap. How was the ION built relatively cheaply? They knew what they wanted, spending the time and money to define the project early on and avoid costly changes or conflicts later. They reused existing rail and power corridors, a mixture of luck and ingenuity, which got them a third of the route. They had strong political backing and authority with the regional government, reducing but not eliminating jurisdictional squabbles. They managed risk, not just offloading responsibility to the private sector, but also reducing the overall level of risk. And finally, they built a functional, no-frill system with simple, standardized stations. And without going overboard on non-essential improvements to the surrounding infrastructure, as nice as those can be. I've become kind of obsessed with the problem of transit construction costs. It's not even just about spending too much money on a particular project, but that we could be getting lots more transit for the same amount of money if we could figure out how to build like other totally normal developed countries like Spain, Korea, and Finland. Many cities like Toronto themselves used to build much more cheaply just 20 years ago. 
We used to be better. We've gone backwards on this. This is up there with housing as one of the biggest issues facing our cities. But at least people know that housing is a problem. When it comes to transit costs, people might know that a particular project in their city has been a boondoggle. But most people don't know that the Anglosphere and adjacent jurisdictions like Quebec have gotten so much worse than peer countries. It's important to look at the few projects that have avoided this trend, like the Waterloo LRT, the Canada Line in Vancouver, or the Montreal REM to see how they did it. If you haven't seen it yet, you should watch this video on the REM covering many of the same themes. Finally, if you live nearby, you can fill in the region's survey on the next phase of the ION to Cambridge. Also sign up for INI's Waterloo Region, a newsletter on the project from the local transit advocacy group TriTag. Thanks for watching through to the end of the video. Don't forget to bike and subscribe, and a special thanks to our supporters on Patreon.